his computer. Okay. All right, and you're still seeing my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, so what I want to say is um, this is the first of four uh, workshops. Um, the second one will be two weeks, September 30th, and it, it'll be, you know, kind of in a similar vein, but talking more specifically about different techniques of representation. And we'll have a guest who's really, really uh, kind of an expert experimenter <laughs> um, and, and very awesome, uh, uh, you know, just generally in terms of theoretical ideas around it and also practice. Leah Wolfman, she's currently teaching at SciArc um, as a graduate from there. And then in um, a month from now, on October 14th, we'll have a workshop about act, hybrid activism, sort of like what does, you know, how does activism, how does sort of political engagement look in these disconnected times, in these times of blended learning. And we'll have Lexi Tian, which probably a lot of you know, she's uh, teaching at GSEP and she's teaching ADR1, which is, um, uh, uh, you know, something I've also been taught for, teaching for a few years before, uh, prior to this. So that should be a really interesting one. And then the final one, um, you know, given that a lot of you are, some of you are probably graduating, um, the idea is that we'll talk about hybrid practice. So, you know, when, once you enter the, the world of, uh, uh, let's say, um, of work or business or outside of school, you know, you're going to encounter a very different uh, environment than what we, um, than maybe what you expected going into school. and. Uh, that's something to discuss, but actually I think that this moment in crisis is not just something that will go back to normal, but that things will definitely change for us and influence how architectures practice in some ways. And so even just through living through this, through this experience. Um, um, so uh, yeah, that last conversation is sort of talking about how how this moment, sort of hybrid moment we're experiencing now, this blended learning is going to affect um, architecture practice. So. Uh, you know, kind of talking also about my own experience and talking about how um, send you off sort of with with hopefully some ideas of, of how you can um, go into the world after this. So um, this is just to give you an overview of the overall thing. So uh, now I want to start this this lecture about you know uh, let's say that we are and, and virtual connection actually through a very physical phenomenon and that kind of asking. Um, you know, what is, the, what, you know, how can we replicate the water cooler effect? You guys know what the water cooler effect is? Anybody has anybody has heard this before? It's pretty common. <laughs> okay, this is like too much, too much pressure. Um, I have you up on the second screen, but anyway, the water cooler effect, just in case, is this idea that, you know, when people have sort of meeting points where they are, in a way, forced to encounter each other because they have to, like something very functional, like getting water, coffee, um, they'll exchange gossip and information in these points. And so this is a Harvard study um, where they were basically analyzing so the, the, the height of the building um, indicates the number of citations that a publication got, and then the color indicates how close or how, how many water coolers were actually placed in this building. So there was actually a correlation that was found between sort of these kind of places of encounters. Oh, sorry, it wasn't just one, but it was basically if the two scientists actually worked in the same building and not in like a totally different location. So basically it seems to prove, and this was, you know, done when there was already, internet was already a thing. So, but still this idea that, that basically the people who were working together, if they were physically very close, um, uh, there were more citations on this paper. So they were basically better papers. And another physical phenomenon is the Allen curve, which was studied in the in, in the seventies, and that basically says that the closer you are uh, to somebody, um, the more face to face communication you will have, which is the I mean makes sense, right? Like you probably talk more to a person who like happens to sit very close to you than somebody who's really far away. So in this sense, um, but I think what, what's interesting about the curve is how extreme the change is. So you know, when you're very, very close to somebody, you'll be talking to them all the time, essentially. And even at eight meters, um, which is like, you know, 20 feet away, basically the, this curve drops off uh, really drastically. And, you know, once you get to like 60 meters or 24 meters, basically there's almost no communication anymore, like it's below the 5% uh, line. So, so physical proximity 
um, at least in 1977, had an extreme uh, impact on how much people would communicate. So in that sense, you know, um, my question today and to you is sort of how, how does virtual technology impact the Allen curve? Of course, now, you know, we're talking to people and not just now, but since some decades now at this point, we're talking to people all the time, every day that are infinitely, not infinite, but very far away, or, you know, it doesn't really matter how far away they are. So in that sense, the Allen curve, um, but the Allen curve still, still holds, right? When you're in a physical space, you'll still be talking to the people who are closer to you. So you might actually be uh, talking to somebody who's physically close to you a lot more and somebody who's at a random distance because they're connected to you through the internet, but somebody who's in the same space right now, I'm in an office space that, you know, people on the other side that are 60 meters away from me, I don't talk to them at all, even though they're much easier, even though they're kind of physically in the same space as somebody who would be on another continent. So this is just an important framework for this conversation. And finally, the third concept is propinquity, which is this idea of, you know, uh, uh, the more often you run into somebody, the more likely you are to marry them or to, you know, be friends with them or to have, like, to like them. And so, uh, uh, again, a very simple concept, very intuitive, but it has a huge impact on how societies work, you know, in terms of, like, if you, how you design cities, how you design intersections, how do you design, uh, uh, again, sort of, like, accidental places of encounter, um, because as simple as running into somebody every day increases your risk, your, your, not your risk, but your, <laughs> the likelihood of liking them, uh, you know, by a really, really high percentage. So propinquity, it's a fancy word, you can also just throw it out. It sounds good, really like, oh yeah, I want to increase the propinquity in that, in that design. So um, again, these three physical concepts, you know, I guess as a starting point that, that have proven to be so useful, uh, uh, kind of can act as a framework for us to think about how we can recreate or think those in VR. But before we get into VR right away, there's like obviously a lot of communication tools online, right? Here's just some kind of a personal section of things that I use um, or that I'm really familiar um, on an everyday level, but you know, there's, there's an even much larger ecosystem. But there's, today we'll be talking about 3D tools specifically because, um, you know, well, we're architects and I think it has like a particular fascination to how we're working and also because 3D tools actually bring back some of these phenomena that, you know, um, uh, that I've just talked about. They, they can bring in this idea of distance and space. So um, in, uh, in three dimensional environments, we can actually maybe perhaps recreate some of these um, physical phenomena that I just mentioned because they're entirely removed from something like WhatsApp, right? Like it really doesn't matter how close you are physically to somebody. So I'll browse over this. It's mostly just, you know, uh, kind of super, super brief history of VR. So uh, essentially uh, in, in 1838, um, this uh, guy, Wheatstone, kind of invented um, the stereoscope. And that was essentially just the idea that if you look at two images at an angle, your eyes start to project a three-dimensional image between these two planes. And actually a concept that's related to, I mean, some of you might know that I'm really obsessed with photogrammetry and with photogrammetry, it's the same idea that if you have two planes, you know, and you, you put them at an angle, you essentially start creating a three-dimensional image. And this is really the foundation of VR up to today. You know, when you, um, in the end, everything you create from the computer comes from a flat image that is just projected at a certain angle. Um, and, you know, fast forward more than 100 years later, um, there, so Morton Heilig is kind of considered the father of photogrammetry. And again, those are just very beautiful images, you know, sort of this is a patent of something he called the sensorama and the idea was that it would be like a fully immersive theater or so something where you would basically have, um, you know, a 3D movie. And he really believed in that, that that would be the future of movies and that's how everyone's going to make movies very soon. And obviously that didn't happen. But, you know, in terms of VR, it, it was definitely a very visionary concept. And he even had smell uh, integration. He had uh, sort of, uh, uh, I think that this chair, as you see, was kind of moving. So you really had like a full, full immersive experience when you were watching these. But I think there were only six movies actually made um, for, that, for that device. Um, and here's some of, so this same guy, Morten Halleck, created these, um, patterns here and you know this looks very much like a, like a VR headset as we know it today and he called it the telesphere mask and 
um, it didn't really um, do that much like you it, it wasn't tracking you you didn't, it didn't know where you are in space you know so it wouldn't move with your head but it did have you know a three-dimensional effect when you were looking through and then even Sutherland uh, which you know some of you might know from Sketchfab I love talking about him every every year um, in AR but he's essentially kind of like the, the person who really invented graphical user interfaces he also experimented with VR uh, and built this uh, slightly dangerous looking device and he also called it the sword of Damocles some kind of engineering joke I guess but um, you know again advancing uh, this idea of VR from a technical perspective and at the same time the military already started using uh, VR in uh, training and actually in uh, um, you know military applications which actually to this day is being is being very heavily used by the military um, for um, on one hand uh, training purposes but actually also in com in combat um, and you know in uh, this was I think early 70s Walter Pichel is an Austrian architect who created this kind of uh, prototype so they were actually working they were more conceptual pieces but they uh, you know projected I guess an architectural um, uh, kind of projected this idea of of, 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 of of an architecture that can be worn that is like the smallest possible space and that can also um, uh, then you know be literally inhabited and, and, and um, kind of transported to different worlds and so these prototypes are um, you know kind of humorous almost but um, they maybe wouldn't be included in a regular history of VR but in obviously in architecture school I think they're relevant um, and then in the late 80s, 90s, they were the first actual sort of, you know, beyond sort of um, enthusiasts and researchers and nerds and people who are art and architects, they were the first companies who were trying to make money with this. So VPL Research was kind of like the first company that, you know, really tried to develop headsets and also these, these gloves. Um, and, um, but obviously that wasn't ready yet for the big consumer market, but they actually did, you know, produce a lot of really interesting products. Um, and it was used in um, by Crystal River Engineering for um, to train astro astronauts. So that was also an early application in theory state image. You know, it's always hard to know from these images how well those things work. I mean, they look really cool, but <laughs> they probably were like really grainy and black and white. But um, maybe that that would be another another kind of research or exhibition to actually figure out to replicate the experiences within these. Um, and then in uh, in the 90s, um, you know, the virtuality group actually started producing larger quantities and, and made these um, devices for arcades. So arcades actually had VR, you know, kind of routine in the 90s already. And I guess they were the early adopters at the time for people playing games. Um, here, nicely advertised. I really like this this image of this lady in, in uh, So. You know, 2012 was the year that Kickstarter started developing, but not they had they had started like oh, not very long, not very much earlier. So basically, uh, one or two years prior, this 16-year-old guy essentially started developing um, Oculus and uh, uh, really revolutionized the market through that. And he started off, you know, essentially just hacking together headsets, but um, really quickly gained traction and this was uh, a Kickstarter that he started and you can see here that the goal was $250,000 and he got 10 times more he got like two and a half million because people were so convinced of his technology and he got all, he, he got all these backers and anyway Oculus you know from become from being this like tiny independent company that barely made like you know uh, that money was sold billions uh, for billions to Facebook only a couple of years later and is now kind of the flagship product of Facebook and what's interesting about that particular today was actually that so Facebook launched the Oculus Quest 2 which is a new headset which really um, you know Mark Zuckerberg was live on um, was streaming live on the internet on YouTube and he was basically just totally is a hundred percent believer in VR and thinks it's going to change everything and I guess we have that in common in some way, but um, you know, he really wants Facebook to kind of control the whole thing. And so 
uh, can get into that into debate, but here's you know another in that in that super quick history we can see how it went from sort of like a very niche thing to at the moment being something that's being that's about really, and this time I think really, because it's definitely the technology that always seems like two years away, right? Like people in 2016, people got really excited when, when the first Oculus Quest came out. So like, okay, it's it's here, the hype, you know, and um, we'll see. I mean, maybe maybe not this year, but definitely in the next few years, uh, I think it's going to arrive in a much bigger market. Um, in any case, so here, here's some uh, a really uh, funny image or you know, images of, of the Oculus quest sort of pattern. Um, also, you know, if you look at them closely, kind of revealing sort of this ideas of, a lot of ideas about how that would be used. So clearly it's people at home and then they're, they're, they're dreaming of the beach and they're very, um, you know, you, you, can, you can sort of analyze what kind of people they are and sort of like projecting a very specific kind of person to be using this. Also here, um, you know, we have this, guy it's, a, it's always a guy um, uh, kind of looking at this choices would you like who would you like to reach you may say mom or jane <laughs> so you can like choose between these two images um and decide who she wants to reach with, with you know through his goggles just to kind of like some kind of uh avatar of this other person and again here a very sort of conventional domestic interior uh, or, or exterior in that case like the dog in a little house so it, yeah here just just some context for how uh, how this was imagined to be used and so on. So we are in architecture today. It's actually already being used somehow, and you know, seems to be mostly by white men for some reason. Like on all the images, it's always, it's always just just that kind of population using it. I mean, which is definitely not the case, but the marketing images for some reason. The the um, um, but it's actually used very much in sort of uh, BIM BIM. Uh, engineering purposes. So there's there's apps that are exporting models from Revit to VR, and here you can also there's a link. You know this. Um, oh, I didn't want to click it. Um, uh, this is a, a project by Big and UN Studio um, to kind of help not just visualize um, uh, projects in VR, but also use them for kind of quick prototyping and changes. Um, but it's still in development. So this one is actually, you know, uh, again, it's one of these technologies that's about to happen. But isn't isn't quite happening yet. So um, and this definitely falls into the, into this category. But some some apps are out there and working, just maybe not super super widely adopted. I would say. I mean, there's maybe a few firms that are really really actively using it. So this is one part of the component that's leading up to what we're going to do today. There's, you know, just to get an, an idea, okay, VR has a pretty recent history of, you know, being more and more used and adapted, but still isn't quite through on the consumer market fully. Like there's probably, probably none of you has a VR headset, I'm assuming, does anybody have one? No? Okay. So see, it's, it's even architects, even people who are working with 3D are kind of like, it's not, it's not quite there yet. But um, so the other thing that that um, is interesting in terms of um, web-based VR is, you know, it's kind of this idea of creating worlds on the web, and that has a long history too. Um, so this is just just an image of an of a, you know an 80s game, just to kind of get into your head. So how recently games looked very very low res. Um, and obviously now we have a much higher fidelity, but this is actually 96 Creative is the first, or I don't know if the first, but a very popular um, web-based world building game. So as you can see, you know, people really um, uh, on, on you know, this idea that you can be on the browser, you can interact with others. So it was also a massive multiplayer game. So basically there were like, you know, I don't know how many, but definitely multiple people in there at the same time uh, uh, playing and kind of, kind of um, seems like some kind of conquest game. I've never played it, but just to kind of give you context that you know people have been doing um, uh, playing games on the on the web for a long time, just not really fully in 3D. So this is still a flat image that you know is an axle and it can be moved around, but it isn't actually fully three-dimensional and immersive. And that changed in 2003. 2003 was the year Second Life came out. I mean, it might have happened before, but the Second Life was the first like really, really widely adopted game. So um, uh, 
you know, uh, people who are already in architecture school from at the time remember the Second Life was just like a huge thing, and every every designer and everybody was, um, uh, you know, doing something in Second Life. Uh, uh, people people thought that this is the future. People there was a huge business model around it. People made money building building stuff for Second Life, um, and it, you know, as much as quickly as it sort of emerged as a trend, it also faded away pretty quickly. And it, I think most people, including me, kind of forgot about it until really this year. <laughs> so 2020 was sort of the year when everyone suddenly remembered that Second Life exists and uh, supposedly even got more users than ever before. So um, they call it a pandemic boost and all of a sudden, and it looks totally different, you know, in the meantime, they had developed this like much further, there's like hundreds of worlds. I mean, it's a massive, still a massive, massive undertaking. It feels kind of dated when you're in there, but it's still fascinating just the fact that how what people have created because it's i think the reason why it was so successful um you know i would say despite everything you can consider it successful that that 50 season, 57 million people decided at some point to make an account I and mean, then people were in it for years and years um was that people really have a huge amount of uh in the, you know uh say over how this was going to look like so basically people really there were very few rules in that sense of what you could create and people could customize everything from their avatars to the world that they were in and again, this was all three-dimensional and on the web, so basically everybody could access it. Everybody could access it from their computer. Um, you didn't need any specialized goggles or headset or anything for it. You could just you could just be in there. Um, and um, yeah, most recently, I mean, this is this was something that you know really like young young kids from Brooklyn created these parties um, called Cringe Dad where they use Second Life in a totally, well, not new way. People have been throwing parties in there for a long time, but it was kind of like an unexpected combination of, you know, a, you know, fairly old, almost 20 years old technology with like a really, really contemporary music and, uh, uh, you know, really um, kind of a, a, a new party that suddenly migrated onto that platform. And uh, they combine it with other platforms like uh, Twitch, and YouTube and um, uh, you know here I, I really love that that's on, on their website where they say party chat stream right so you have you basically to have the full experience you have to have um, a Twitch stream uh, running and so you would have the audio from there and then you would have uh, you know the your avatar dancing in in Second Life so 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 they really kind of combine these different modes to create an experience so. Fast forward to today, there is actually quite a few different web, v so sorry, not web, but the VR platforms that are social. Um, so, and, and most of them came out, so you can see here, I put in the dates within the last five years. So the first one was actually Altspace. And Altspace was, you know, um, really an experiment of like, how can people coexist in VR and it was very enthusiastic user base, small but very enthusiastic user base, and developed, everyone kind of felt passionate because it was something really new and, 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 and exciting. But it was definitely, uh, you know, a uh, uh, startup that was financed by, um, by venture capitalists. And so what happened in 2017, essentially only two years after its existence, they ran out of money and they actually closed the um, closed art space down. And, uh, you know, the small, community that was in it was completely um, distraught. And one of the developers that had worked in Altspace actually, you know, and, and was out of a job, he was the person that then moved on to start building Mozilla Hubs. And I'll get into Mozilla Hubs in a second, but, um, you know, in the meantime, so again, I said 2016 was a crucial year for VR. This is when, you know, some of the first consumer headsets came out, the Oculus, the HTC Vive. And so Sansar and VRChat are, Two um, kind of universes that have you know slightly different flavor, basically a slightly different level of detail, but they work quite similarly. That you have to download a customized app, you have to have a customized gear, but they also both work on the desktop. So, so you have kind of a, a mix of people who are using it on desktop, and you have people who are using it in VR. Um, but it really so on a desktop, it kind of is actually very similar to Second Life, and in VR, you have like a totally different experience because Second Life was never VR compatible, right? It was only on the desktop. And you see VR chat is a phenomenon. It has like during the pandemic, it's up to 1,600 concurrent users, which is a lot for VR. Um, and in any case, this is sort of the current um, 
you know, landscape, which is also, I think, really interesting for architects to explore, just to go in and see what's up, because anybody use any of these, or is that, is that new? <laughs> I'm curious. Newish? Okay. You should try, you should try, because they're kind of fascinating worlds in, in themselves. Um, so, but Mozilla Health, again, founded by this guy who was actually, who kind of had, not founded, but he was the main, kind of the person leading the team, he put together a realization, which is, you know, if you create a social space that people actually care about, but that social space is depends on funding by a totally third party, by, you know, some kind of investor, and that funding goes away, then all of a sudden you take away people's social connections. And so his mission was to kind of not let that happen and build a decentralized VR environment, a VR social environment that lives on the web so that where you don't where you're not required to you know download any proprietary software but uh, the idea is that it's open source so anybody can take the code and do whatever they want with it and build on it add to it change it um, and also that it's not running on a single server but you know becomes kind of, kind of like the it's sort of this type of utopian idea that drove the early internet and um, so and Mozilla was actually um, you know, interested in the same in the same ideas. Um, they're kind of like a browser that was always interested in in, in ideas of uh, privacy and open internet, and so they were the ones who help him build it and support uh, the infrastructure around it. So here's there's a and I think link um, so you can also read the full essay. But here's basically his his story of how he is given just just what I just summed up how he kind of went from you know a very uh, from, from developing Outspace to going into um, uh, into Mozilla Hubs, and one really important thing here, you know, when you're talking about social spaces, is um, the intentional versus unintentional co-presence. Where I kind of come back to the water cooler. So in a lot of these online games and uh, environments, you just go in and same for second bites, and you just run into strangers, and a lot of things can happen in that moment. So. This would be unintentional co-presence, right? It, it can be pleasant, but it can also be kind of liberating to talk to a stranger on, on the internet, but it can also be really weird. And so the idea with Mozilla Hubs is that actually you create private rooms so for specific audiences. And then within these private rooms, you know, you can invite whoever you want and make it into, into events with people that you actually already know. In some way, it doesn't have to be actually know them in person, but you know the part of a group, like for example, GSUB. And um, so this is, you know, intentional co-presence. And he makes a really important point here, which I think is um, is relevant when thinking about these things. Is that, you know, this kind of social, um, the, the whatever social environment we're creating in VR is is all by design. So it's none of this is accidental. It might be not in necessarily mal malintentioned, or people don't think about it, but like all these ways that people encounter them to encounter encounter each other in in these spaces is absolutely a design thing um, so another thing that's that's really important in mozilla is that there's um something called flexible identity so you don't have to have one account with which you log in um, uh, so today when when facebook launched the um, quest basically they also talked about horizon which is their new social social uh, VR platform and there your avatar is tied to um, your Facebook profile so basically you're always in the end they can always trace you back to yourself but in Mozilla Hubs you can log in with as many accounts as you want so you have a flexible identity and you can sort of like you know there's basically multiple versions of you that can enter and always have a different avatar so it, there's really significant differences between uh, between these type of social spaces that are just important to consider. Um, all right, so let's go into this space real quick, all together, and then uh, and then we'll start to um, have a little bit of a conversation with Matt and we'll kind of like, um, and actually all of you because there's not too many, so we can we can just chat about these issues. So if you click. Um, you can either click here in, in the presentation or I'll also send the link in uh, inside of the chat here. All 
Oh yeah, I'm <laughs> so you're anyway muted, so you can probably hear the music from my okay. So here's the yeah. So the first link that I just sent again was the hub link and the second one. Oops. I uh, just want to mute this here. Okay. So, um, oh, where are you guys? Oh, here you are. I see Katie. I see a few different people. So here you see kind of like a, a sort of spa environment. Um, and you can still see my screen, right? Um, so when you come in, you can, you, you probably already uh, were asked to, to choose to have an avatar. Here on the left hand side, um, you can always click here and set set name and avatar and you can change um, you see I'm, I'm doing this weird little rod <laughs> um, so it's nice when you, when you put your name in because then that allows you to have other people know who you are but again you can also be anonymous if you prefer and um, so you can also talk to other people and you can test it with your friends afterwards you can talk to other people Within within the hubs, and it's actually distance. The distance, the part, uh, the distance you are to somebody actually matters. So you will hear them louder if you're closer to them, and if you're further away, they kind of fade away. So with large groups, I actually like using Zoom for sound, and then just kind of walk around in here. So if you're a gamer, you're going to be familiar with it. If not, you can just use W to move forward, D to move right, and A left, and S to move backwards. So sort of like moving back and forth with the fingers um, or the same thing with arrow keys if you press the g button you can actually float so with g you can go up and um, so you see probably see that i'm just it's fly mode i'm floating up and i can see the whole scene from above yeah i see some of you are already flying <laughs> um and the cool thing about this is that you know you can if you have a vr headset right now you can also enter in VR and interact with all of us, but we are on our browsers and you can actually look at it on your phone as well. So that's, you know, a really exciting kind of hybrid uh, model. Oh, did somebody put that? Oh, wow. I love that. <laughs> I love that flaming avatar. <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, I just wanted to everyone to, to come in yeah you can start playing around you can you can you know um you can you can kind of show emotions you can chat at the bottom of the of the page um and you can also bring in 3d models here in the create panel and bring in images bring in videos stuff like that um so i'll i'll go uh <laughs> i'll go at the end i'll i'll talk about how to the workflow how, how to upload this model from Rhino. It's gonna be a quick, uh, quick demo, but I just wanted everybody to kind of see it first before we, before we talk. Um, I'm gonna go back to the presentation. Um, now everybody's distracted, which is good. So, um, all right. If you go on my screen, so one one firm that has been um, doing really interesting work in that in that area is called space popular or popular i don't know they're um uh they, re they recently did an exhibition um at the reba in london and it got cancelled midway um because it was open through february and um then they built another hub basically a hub version for it and this is so far the best hubs i've seen the best kind of like, you know hubs use I've, I've, I've seen so far so i the, the hub room is linked to this image in the presentation. So if you're if you're curious, just go ahead and uh, explore this maybe after because it's really um, a nice way of playing with sort of you know real elements and then also virtual elements and kind of like I mean there's a lot more to be done and hopefully some of you will create totally different things. But um, you know at least in terms of now and everything is very fresh and they made this also you know, very quickly in May, it was sort of like one of the first things that 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 was brought out in this kind of social VR space. Um, and yeah, definitely something interesting to explore. And they also created this room for the AA, kind of like an exhibition space 
um, it's called the a earth gallery and basically it's just a little kind of a, an atrium in which you can walk around and, and, and look at different drawings from the AAA. Um, and here another example, this is where I got my avatar, it's called um, Area. And again, you can click on the link and they have this really cool thing. I don't know really how, they, how they did that, I really want to figure it out, but basically you can click on an avatar and become that avatar. So you could have these really cute blobs and stuff. So if you're, if you're interested in that, uh, in not having, because you know, that Mozilla avatar is kind of not that, Pretty. So <laughs> here it can become a little bit more artsy, I guess. And this is actually the beginning of a really large project. Um, it's a Viennese group and they're commissioning all these VR artworks um, and uh, also have a Mozilla Hub version for it. So you can really go explore. There's videos, there's different worlds that you can enter. So one important thing, what you can do in Hubs, you can link worlds. You know, you can sort of um, connect them to each other. It's basically like a portal or like a gate. So you can kind of create a lobby space and then kind of enter all these other worlds through it. Um, so, you know, for those of you, you know, who, who are thinking, okay, kind of curious, maybe I want to buy a headset. Um, I would say they kind of come at all price points, really. You can, you can, you know, get a uh, cardboard, which is like 10 bucks and you can use a bit of foam. And it gives you kind of at least an idea of VR, and especially you know in architecture, maybe if you're just mostly interested in pre-boom spaces, this is totally not a, you know not a bad investment. I would say just to even be, get a, get a taste for it. Um, then there's kind of like a mid-range uh, type of VR where you can um, that are also phone-based. So basically, you put your phone that creates the image and then uh, translates it into VR. Um, and there's some of them that actually have controllers too, so you have like some level of interaction. Because obviously the cardboard is not really, you know, interactive with your environment. Um, at the moment, um, and again, I, you know, with all my critique of Oculus, um, it is the only wireless headset, or the only one that I know of, there's probably more, but the one that, I, that is kind of widely adopted that is wireless means you, you don't, you know, you don't need to be kind of, tethered to a PC or you don't need to have um, any trackers installed. You can just walk around freely um, and you have these controllers with which you can, you're, you're fully interactive with your hand. So for playing games, for navigating spaces, for all that stuff, it's a really, really good headset. Um, and then there's the high-end versions, which like, you know, the Index um, and the HTC Vive and those they're really powerful and you can play like really high end graphics with, um, with them. I mean, obviously the Mozilla Hubs is sort of, it's a little bit low res, right? It's still sort of, uh, because it's so um, platform independent because it works on so many different, different uh, things. It, it also, you know, doesn't have such a great visual quality, but if you're, if you wanna go for the high end stuff, um, those are the headsets. But for me, it always felt like, you know, that's just too much of an investment. Um, but yeah, I think even with the lower end, um, so kind of mid-range headsets, you can really get a, a, a taste for it and, and start kind of um, thinking how VR can make impact your practice. Okay, we'll we'll talk about the workflow a little bit later. I'm actually gonna um, now give over to Matt um, to talk a little bit about our um, the project that we we worked on in February and sort of. I'm going to talk a little bit about his, his thoughts and some of, some of the projects um, that uh, he's been thinking about in, in, in recent months. Thanks, Pika. Um, yeah, uh, so um, I've been kind of <clears throat> looking at this stuff bubble up a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, before COVID, there was this kind of like um, alternative I would say this like artists working this in alternative ways, um, using digital uh, platforms to kind of uh, get around the difficulty of displaying either at commercial galleries or big institutions because they're just kind of difficult to penetrate. So they were creating their own sort of online spaces for um, displaying art and, and working with art. Um, and it's something that I've been kind of like paying a lot of attention to and now that, um, and now in some of my conversations with Bika as well, we've, we've kind of gotten into this together now, 
Um, and um, I wanted to explain, you know, talk a little bit about the exhibition that we did in February. Um, and it was, uh, I guess it kind of grew out of that interest in this new this world of people kind of creating these like digital social spaces. Um, um, and I don't know if, can you play the um, website here? Yeah, um, so I guess oh, I first can, off. It's not linked, but I can just open it up, so. I guess this idea of digital social space kind of started with, um, before you do that, Bika, yeah, it's okay. We can do that after actually. So if you go to Josh's slide, uh -huh. the idea of digital social space kind of started, you know, back in 2016 when the, um, when the presidential election happened and there was all this kind of um, back and forth about the, uh, politics of information and how people are using information to kind of influence politics and influence uh, geopolitics. So, I mean, we all like heard about how there were, you know, p potentially or definitely uh, information campaigns happening uh, around the 2016 election to, you know, influence one way or the other. Um, and it kind of comes from this idea that, you know, information is now kind of a new, um, a kind of new territory that um, people, you know, that's kind of one of the main ways now that, that politics happens. It, we still see traditional warfare and people taking territory, but um, a lot of it is, is now even more and more uh, just information wars. Um, and so I think this, I, this idea makes it super territorial. It makes it spatial um, that there would be these uh, like transnational kind of, um, information wars. And so online that looks a lot like these, the, the previous slide that's people um, on Instagram kind of make creating these like insane identities where they're like pro and like, you know, uh, anarcho primitivist, communist, uh, traditional, um, they just make up all these, these crazy ideologies that, that don't make sense together, like libertarian monarchism or um, anarcho socialist syndicalist. I mean, it's almost like a game that they play to kind of like come up with the most weird identity. Um, but I think it speaks to this kind of the spatial aspect of this stuff is that people are gathering online in spaces like Instagram and 4chan and basically anywhere on the internet becomes this kind of like breeding ground for this sort of uh, information to be exchanged and, and ideologies to be um, developed and disseminated and people to be radicalized and sort of building consensus. So we no longer need the kind of like salon in, in Paris to gather, to exchange ideas and exchange these types of um, things. So a researcher named Josh Citarella kind of gets into this stuff. Um, and, and I really see his work quite similarly to like forensic architecture or um, someone like, um, I don't know if you're all familiar with like the 2016 um, Oslo Triennale where most of those projects were kind of like mapping projects or the, these sort of like um, goldsmiths uh, in London style, forensic architecture style um, analysis of uh, these territories and what's happening. So these using spatial knowledge to like capture what's happening in the world and display it in a new way. So I kind of see Josh's work as venturing into these new territories of social media of the, of the dark recesses of the internet to find these kinds of commu communities so where these communities are being um, built and and fostered uh, becomes a kind of territorial kind of like spatial research project um, and so one of the works in the arsenal that we commissioned was he took that and sort of phys made it physical by using these um, these flags, um, or he, he had these flags made on Etsy. Um, so he found these flags that these kids online had created, these identities that they had been working together on um, and found these and made, made them uh, into physical objects. So these are real flags that were created by people and then he printed them out 
um, and people display these like it's actually a thing that kids do too. They they print these things out and uh, display them in their rooms and stuff like that. It's almost like concert posters now for kids. You know, Generation Z kind of uses politics almost as like pop culture. So um, I guess the, the spatiality of this project is what I wanted to kind of bring up because this online social space is what has been kind of um, fostering these new communities especially in an era I think where social media is maybe losing some of its ground as a place where real discussion happens. I think people are getting a little bit tired of the toxicity of social media and the kind of like just the way people talk on there. Sometimes I think people are less comfortable having, uh, and so people have been trying to find these um, kind of semi-public semi spaces, you might say. So they're like um, places like Discord, uh, where you need an invitation to join, or um, the places and the spaces that Biko was uh, describing, I think are, are right along those lines where people are sort of in these new smaller uh, online environments to uh, foster community and bring together people in a way. So um, one, one example of that um, was, uh, Actually, if you go to the next one, Bika, I think maybe it makes more sense this way. So one, one example of that is this, um, this group of artists. Um, and you can find these videos on the FIDI website. Um, this is Philip Kostick's work. Um, and it's, we commissioned this one as well because he had been going on World of Warcraft. Um, and he and a bunch of his friends were walking around in World of Warcraft um, and this is pre-pandemic. They just played World of Warcraft, but it was a lot of art people. And so they were like hanging out on World of Warcraft and making art critique and talking about art in World of Warcraft. So rather than getting together at like a bar like they would have in the 60s or something, people are now doing this in these game spaces. Um, and so gathering in, in this online environment, um, and you can see the video and, and see what it's about because it's very... It's pretty funny. I would definitely recommend watching it. It's really funny. Yeah, you, need, you need to watch it to get it. It's like, a, it's, he's walking around the game and commenting, you know, as if it's like a fine art show. It's, 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 it's really quite a unique thing. <laughs> it's really funny and it's really critical of the art world and kind of art speak. And it's just, I mean, it's actually quite, quite um, produced through, you know, gathering in a game space. Um, and so I think these kind of spaces or they're happening. And that's why I think it's, inter it's important for you guys to know about this stuff because it's these, these kind of online communities are already forming whether or not architects are involved. And so it's not so much how architects can change this phenomenon or, or anything or what we can learn from it. Um, it's more like how could we engage with it and, and, like, and use it to, or be, help it. Like how can we make it better? by using our architectural knowledge and skills to, you know, build out these spaces to be interesting places um, for people. So um, another example of the, uh, the kind of work in the Arsenale around these social spaces was this work with, by Pierce Myers, who um, was a student at Strelka, and he was working on taking some of Josh's work about these kind of eco futures and um, these, these political futures and making it three-dimensional um, with uh, all this, um, with, with using game engines and, and narrative building and filmmaking. Um, he's a student of Liam Young as well. So um, kind of building these worlds out into places, it, they're really places that, um, you know, hold these kind of political ideologies and these um, ideas, um, with, within them. So um, similar to Philip's piece, it, it kind of creates these like online environments for social and political action. And not necessarily activism, but just kind of community building and political uh, for like, uh, you know, futurism, let's say. Um, and so I think in those, in those ways, architects, you know, have an opportunity to see these spatial phenomenon and um, and kind of uh, engage with them in an interesting way. Now through the tools that Beek is showing you, um, I think these kinds of these kinds of um, projects, uh, these multimedia projects, 
these uh, social um, spaces, um, they really need you know architects to engage with them and and work on them. And there's a lot of potential out there um, because there's a lot of really innovative things happening uh, in in these spaces, um, especially you know in Mozilla Hubs and in VR Chat and um, and just a couple other kind of fun examples of these kind of things I think you, you might enjoy. Like these people uh, gathered in Tom Clancy's um, video game called uh, The Division, which is a kind of dystopian uh, multiplayer game uh, on um, uh, in uh, set in New York City, and they went around and, and this one guy gave a tour of New York City in the game to his friends. So they made this video of it, and it's just kind of a fun video, but it shows the kind of experimental nature of, of these spaces, that these spaces actually are places that, even though they're virtual and not built, are incredibly urban and architectural. Um, they're kind of public spaces in a way that um, I think deserve architects' attention and and uh, and could provide a kind of new platform for people to project uh, a pretty radical architecture onto as it, you know, it, it does a lot of the things that paper architecture did where it can escape the limits of uh, gravity and, and um, time and, you know, the time it takes to build something and, and, and the cost to build something. So these worlds can be constructed quite elaborately um, and these narratives can be built using these new tools that I think opens up the possibilities for entirely new types of architecture. Um, and, and also debate, and also discussion, I think what's interesting about this piece is, the, so in that sense, it's similar to Philip Kostick's piece, piece where these people talk about it in terms of like art historical terms, it's like, oh, look at this modernist building over there, right? Where you're so used, but then they look like first person shooter, <laughs> shooters that walk around in it. So, but I think that's, also really interesting how discourse suddenly is based on these games or, or you know, so even if it's ironic, I think it still has, it's like a new angle on how you can even discuss architecture, right? Like if you could also do it non-ironically and it could also be a really interesting way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the, the most, these, these examples are like extremely experimental because all this stuff's very early. But you can see as this thing that Bika told, showed you, also they're starting to become more necessary in this, not only during COVID, but I think, you know, I would never want to advocate for this as like the, as like a new reality. It would really suck if this is like mandatory now that we have to do everything in virtual spaces. But they do offer us an alternative and a really appealing alternative that can, can um, be, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space going forward to imagine new new ways of building that, as you said, don't have to be ironic and they don't have to be so goofy because they're they're just they're kind of like that because they're super experimental. I think at this early stage, um, similar to this next one, it's a um, I can send it in the chat. This is called New Art City, and it's a whole platform. Um, it's an it's an it's a custom platform. Um, that uh, they, they've had um, several shows in this platform. Um, but you can get a sense, I think, in here of kind of the potential of what these kinds of places can look like um, with in, in, into, in incorporating a lot of multimedia, incorporating videos and sound and, and text and kind of hyperlinks in space where people don't have to just move through a space linearly. They can now jump from place to place um, as same as in uh, Mozilla as Bika mentioned. Um, but you can kind of get a, a sense um, if you click that link of all the different possibilities of how these things can be so kind of enriched by multimedia that, that physical space can't be. here this one is linked also yeah this one is interesting because it's so it's actually using a different framework than mozilla but it also is has the, you know the same qualities of being on the web um, and being interactive and actually has 
it's a little bit more elegant. I mean, the one thing about Mozilla, if you use the default version, oh, um, just turn the button down. If you use the default versions, you know, it's it can it just has a certain aesthetic to it, which is somewhat limiting. And so here you can see an example of somebody who built a custom framework for it, but which it's you know in itself great, but not possible for every project, I guess. Um, especially when you know you're an actor school and you're trying to make something uh, something quick, but it's definitely kind of pushing. This is another example of, of sort of pushing web. 3D, you know, to a new frontier, which also, this project is very recent too, right? Do you know when it came out? Um, it's, they've been doing shows since April, but this, this one that's on the screen right now is super recent, it's like last week. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's also an interesting distinction too, is like, I mean, I think that the VR stuff that you just showed is, is really um, one type of this kind of digital social space, but there's also, I think these, these flat screen, the, the ones that are just on your browser are also another type as well. So um, I don't know, like really, there's like big differences between them two, but I think they kind of operate in the same way also, um, and bringing people in. And the, the, on, the ones in the browser may be a bit more anonymous. I'm not sure. But, mm -hmm. um, and a little bit easier to enter and exit without kind of but that's something also that Bika, you've been talking about. It's like the kind of how certain platforms, I mean, this is all kind of wrapped up in platform discourse as well, like <laughs> the politics of each platform and how do they, you, you've been talking a little bit about how Facebook is trying to get you to sign into your Facebook to use Oculus, which then sort of keeps it. I mean, it's most cynical, it, you know, reifies, um, you know, existing social relationships or existing hierarchies, but at, at its most like, you know, maybe at very least it holds it back, I think, from from being a place of real, you know, uh, it, it just kind of holds it back from being a place of fa fantasy and um, holds back its potential as like a um, creative space where you could make up your own character or like not have a character and just float around or whatever. I guess the platform is a big question here. Yeah, I mean, that, and I think it, it will differentiate itself. I mean, the internet also, you know, it, it, again, it reminds me of earlier versions of the internet. You know, I'm, 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 I guess I'm old enough at this point to remember <laughs> when the internet was kind of wild and unregulated in some way, and um, or at least had that the promise of it. You know, I don't know if it ever really was, but it just had at least conceptually people saw it as this space that would have that kind of freedom embedded and um, and they would live outside of, you know, that kind of would pose a sort of alternate reality or not just virtual reality, but also alternate. Because I think the inter interesting thing about virtual reality in a, in a broader sense is, you know, you can define how much that virtual reality is actually replicating reality or totally disassociating from it. And even in the examples we saw tonight, you know, I think there's such a range and, but it can be, I think that is still such a wide open field to be, to be explored. And I think with, you know, um, Facebook and social media, as we know it now, actually those, those um, profiles are becoming almost more real than we are. They're kind of replacing reality. And I think that's where it gets really tricky, right? And so with VR, I think those things are still to be defined a little bit and there's going to be, you know, plethora of approaches, but that's why it's an exciting moment in my eyes to, to, you know, think, think, think through it as an architect, also think through the possibilities of how we can keep that imaginary space open for, for ourselves and use it in this moment of innocence, <laughs> or, pre, you know, almost. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting time for it right now because it's kind of, we're kind of being forced to develop it. And it'll be interesting to see where it goes after. Like, is it, is it, does it become like alternatives or does it become like, um, are there uses of it that are like, we need, I guess is what I'm, what I'm wondering. Like mm. it's something that's going to be kind of like an art world phenomenon that um, um, 
yeah, it becomes like a, you know, a genre, or is it going to be like something like real that, that finance people feel like they need and <laughs> it becomes developed? <laughs> Well, if you listen to the people that are developing it right now, you know, they're really, they're thinking of it in all kinds of ways. Like, again, that, that guy um, who's developing Mozilla, who, you know, I think is, is very thoughtful about it, but he sees it as, he, he feels so responsible to create Mozilla, not because it's a fun art project, because he believes that, you know, the way that VR is going to inhabit people's lives is going to be so essential that he's afraid of the power of the big companies that are decentralized, privatized companies that are basically are going to be able to control that personal life of people. Because essentially, if socializing is, if, if, if public life and socializing is happening in VR, even if it's just 1% of it, you know, at some point in, in a few years, and what if it's 10%, what if, you know, what if, what if, like, what if you spend the amount of time that we spend in social media on VR? And then, but then that is controlled to an even much higher degree by this kind of by this kind of companies because they can track your, you know, your bio data. They can track your eye movement. They can just it's just like opens up so much more control from these companies, and and so much more addictive um, kind of allows for so much more addictive behavior and emotional attachment to these worlds. I mean. Even just from the amount of time I've spent VR in the last few months since I got a VR headset, you know, I mean, it's not as extreme because there's not that many people I know who are in VR, but I can totally imagine it at this point that people would get really emotionally attached to VR. And I mean, in, in the research for this uh, uh, class, I, was, I found these old videos, which are really funny to watch, where people talk about internet addiction in the 90s, where they're like, oh my God, this person spends up to 30 hours a week on the internet. And I'm like, who does not today like that every person by that definition would be an internet addict so i do think that you know just thinking a little bit back historic like thinking looking at historically and thinking where things go and seeing at least what they what the people developing intend to do you know as architects as spatial thinkers as designers it's it's absolutely crucial to address it and and it's not anymore this sort of uh niche thing or you know or it's a, again we'll see maybe maybe history will prove me wrong and the whole thing and, and yeah it will completely disappear but <laughs> yeah i'm curious i'm curious also from um from those uh, listening right now if you guys have questions or thoughts on, on what you saw I guess I'm wondering if have you has have either of you thought at all about because um, I think the way we're speaking about using it using VR is we design something you know in architecture school let's say we design something that has you know the sort of idea of being in the real world and we kind of temporarily place it in VR to like test it out but do you think that um, but that, that and we sort of like deal with the, you know, the sort of clunkiness and low res or whatever, just because it's like a preview kind of as you're saying. But do you think that in fact, then when we go to the norm, you know, let's say we were building our school projects, you know, which we're obviously not, but the VR would have no, no impact essentially on the build form. Like, is there a version like maybe in the future where it's less of like a, you know, one directional workflow and more like VR actually comes to inflect built form? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really, really good question. I would say that, you know, tools are always inflecting built form and um, tools are not agnostic. And I mean, you're right, if it just becomes the very last step after you've fully designed it and you're, it's really just a render button, maybe it's a little different, but as soon as it will become a little more integrated in the design processes, which I think it it will, right? I mean, we're going to look at Spoke in a second, which is the kind of editor to create VR. Um, uh, you know, it's it's such a, um, it, it, it's actually a, about to be a full 3D environment. So why would you actually do 
these things in Rhino, if you could just do it um, online where you could do it in real time and then translate it straight into, uh, into a model that can be shared. So it's a little bit like, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a similar question. Has Google Docs changed how we write? Um, I would say yes. <laughs> you know, because all of a sudden we can, we can, we can share, I can send it and share it and edit and 10 people can write at the same time. And web VR, basically, you know, Mozilla Hub, with, hopefully if they develop it this way or if not, it's going to be another company building something similar, but the tools are all there. They just need to get a little bit better and a, and a little bit more streamlined. But so if you think of it, that way and not just as a purely representational tool, tool but think of it as like something that can interactively be used to design stuff with other people i think it definitely will have an impact on the built environment just through just through the way, way of using the tool and therefore it gets there's probably deeper implications as well you know but yeah um but yeah and it's a really good question for sure it's it's um you know, uh, definitely would would be. Yeah, I didn't. I actually didn't want want this to kind of seem like oh, this is just a representation tool because I do think that in the end, um, in the end, you know, any 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 representation tool is also a design tool in some capacity. <laughs> I think also uh, one thing that we've seen during COVID and. The space popular thing, I think, is a good example of this. And our um, Friday Hour Sonali show is a good example of this. There's a lot of like kind of recreating um, things that already exist as a kind of stand in for it, which maybe would have been funnier or more interesting uh, before COVID, but now it's just like sad and scary. But um, it's, uh, but I don't know, maybe it wouldn't have. But I think a lot of the discourse around that that sort of recreation of a place makes a lot of sense now. That those that those recreations make sense now because let's say the Cooper Union uh, final show got shut down, so they had to just rebuild it. In uh, and so it was essentially just the Cooper Union show in the Cooper Union building in Unity, and therefore they um, it was a quite nice exhibition where you could see and click on the videos and see videos and see information. It was sort of a, an augmented experience, let's say. Um, but I think that the, the, t the time for that would be, would start to get, it starts to get a little bit tiresome probably to have these like, um, sim you know, simulations or approximations of existing spaces. And probably the more powerful, um, the more powerful uh, examples of all of this in the future would be things like some of the other Mozilla hubs that you were showing, Vika. Um, that kind of uh, obliterate any reality and create these new places where digital content can be displayed natively. And therefore it's not, um, it's being seen as it should be seen or it's designed to be seen in that space. Um, so something like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it just opens up a lot of possibilities for like how you display digital artworks. Um, and that's only, I mean, that's kind of only an art, art, art world, but I could see it applying to, to like architect, you know, more traditional spaces too, where maybe there's like a hybrid space or AR space or something where you start to think about, um, not just like, as you said, Katie, like approximating something that already exists, but like fully using that medium to like bring out the qualities uh, of the medium of the tools. Yeah, I mean, as you were thinking, I was also thinking the other thing that I think will become maybe more relevant is that, you know, people will design buildings, but also at the same time think of digital twins as not necessarily um, replicas, but, you know, you would have a physical building and then you would also have a virtual version in some way that can be an adaptive or, or expanded version of that physical space. So, you know, if you think of an art gallery or I mean, that's just what's on my mind, or any really for our programs, you can imagine, I mean, we're doing it with school right now, right? Like our, our virtual spaces are Zoom, 
because we haven't we haven't really designed anything better. I mean, Zoom is fine, but you know, like, we're we're inhabiting kind of default spaces at the moment. Um, but why don't we also design them? <laughs> and so, uh, but then I think with specific physical spaces, it's already happening in the form of websites, right? Like most physical spaces have a web a web address as well. So if you think it further in terms of spatial web VR, you could also think of like a spatial representation on the web. Um, and I think that if you design these two together, they will also potentially influence each other or, or interfere with each other. And the other way that VR is influencing space right now, which is a really funny, maybe a very temporary version, but people are, including me, removing furniture from their spaces to clear out a VR area, right? So suddenly you have, uh, you know, totally redoing your living room because you need to just open space for for the infinite vastness of the internet. And so that's different, right? And so so maybe that could be, I mean, that's kind of a small scale thing in a way. Could, well, or not, right? Like if you think of larger VR interactions and if that becomes a centerpiece of people's lives, then you would have to rethink how apartments are laid out and you would have to come. Anyway, but this is, yeah, it's not a physical, you know, hybrid condition between the physical and the virtual. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Or the, the twin concept, I mean, even like, you know, there's always an exhibition catalog book that goes with a physical exhibit and that seems totally normal. So why would there not be like this kind of digital twin with the, really, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah we'll see post-pandemic. Post <laughs> Only the twins. <laughs> Actually, in our case, Bika, well, in our, maybe you could pull up the website, Bika, because yeah. it's pretty raw. It's actually .org. It's pretty raw, but I think we, we wanted to do this before the pandemic because the reason we wanted to do it is because the show was only allowed to be up for a month, and we were like, well, we should build something online that'll last forever or more than a month. And so we wanted to build it out so people could see it, um and so we built so beacon 3d scanned the space and then some programmers made it into uh they used unity to um build it out into like a playable game online in the browser um and it's kind of a it's actually a high-res version of it even though it's, it's gray um but you can go and visit all the artworks and you can kind of see the layout of the space so the relationship of the objects to the space and the objects to each other um, kind of rema remains and you get the idea of the show more than you would just from a catalog. So I think in that, in that sense, it is sort of a catalog actually, uh, like a really hypermedia catalog. Um, you can see, you know, you can see ex exhibition documentation, but actually most of the, the video works you can just see. Um, and so in, in that regard, now it seems kind of annoying because it seems like just another one of these <laughs> shows, but it actually was meant to be more like, it was more like a critique of how hard it is to, to have space for a long time. So it was like, well, we can't have the space for more than a month, so we'll just make our own space with all this stuff. Kind of stage it at the location for a month and then broadcast it online. Yeah. And then it got caught up in everybody trying to do the scrambling. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, as much as this was, you know, maybe something that I was trying to do, I'm sure that people, the next round is going to be a lot more interesting in terms of how uh, people will, will approach it, you know, and, and have learned from these approaches. Because I think that before the pandemic, it seems almost like VR and, 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 and it's kind of, or at least sort of, 3D worlds didn't seem that the, the yeah the need wasn't so so clear in a way and so you know kind of kind of also not thinking I think people people were limited to what they could imagine that physical physically able bodied people would do so I think what I and this is the first of all when I realized turn I was okay I would not be able to go to all these things physically. I would always be in that situation. And there's a lot of people who are, you know, in fact, in that situation. And so expanding access in that way, I think it's also a bigger 
a bigger mission or a bigger question of these type of media. Um, all right. Um, oh, wow, it's already 8.20. So, <laughs> um, I, so for those who are interested, I would quickly show the spoke workflow. Um, but I can also, it depends a little bit because it's already late, I can also record it. Um, and just say it as a video. How, how do you guys feel? Do you want to do you want to still see it, or do you, do you feel like we should just wrap wrap it up slowly because it's been long? I don't mind. I'm happy happy either way. If you if you want to see the spoke, just just do this. <laughs> I want to see it. Okay, let's do it then for Matt. <laughs> So, um, yeah, might as well. Right? Five minutes to get a drink of water. What, Lemma? We just take like a five minute drink, drink of water. Oh, take, take, a, take a five minute water break. Um, yeah, let's take a, I'll, I'll just, you can just, just walk away. I'll just, I'm just gonna start the, the rhino so I just, just take a second to set up anyway. So, um, here's a, the scene that we saw earlier, um, and it's you know, as you see, it's a pretty simple rhino file, pretty um, straightforward actually. But uh, let's get texture maps all the materials onto these onto these sort of primary shapes. Um, and in this case, I mean, this is just because I wanted to have a little bit of a handwritten feel to it. Um, hi, Celeste. <laughs> Um, thanks for tuning in. So because I wanted to have a handwritten feel to it, um, I actually just wrote those by hand and photographed them and texture mapped them onto the object. Because in VR, again, in this sort of hybrid spirit of, of connecting between the physical and the virtual, I felt like often this kind of hub spaces that already are very abstracted, so, so I wanted to give it a kind of haptic touch. So, um, and this is a NURBS model and so most of you, when you're modeling in Rhino, you're going to be modeling in NURBS. And there's a really, really important distinction. So when you want to upload stuff to the web, you have to use meshes. And I have a full one hour lecture on YouTube that I can send you if you're interested, um, um, that you could watch where I talk about the differences between NURBS and meshes. And I, I feel like it's essential knowledge for every architect to know. But I feel, unfortunately, in architecture school, still a lot of people don't quite get the idea, but the main thing you need to know is that before you can upload this, you just need to turn it into a mesh and there's a very, very convenient command in Rhino, which is called mesh. So <laughs> you can select your geometry. So you can really just select everything at once. It depends a little bit how heavy your model is. This is a pretty clean model. As you see, there's not too much extra geometry. Um, so this will go pretty quickly um, and you just hit mesh and here you see the dialog, you see like how many um, polygons you'll get and you can choose the preview to kind of see the density. So you can go for, you know, a high density um, of polygons or few polygons, but basically you just want to have a mesh density that is smooth enough that things don't look kind of jagged and no res, but high, uh, but not too high so you don't, your file size doesn't get too, too big. So here you start seeing that this is actually you know, pretty good, the medium range. So, you know, usually I, I, I go with the app, like the medium range, and then if the file size is too big, then I start going down from there. But again, it depends a little bit on the model. So here I have an already meshed model. Um, one thing that you, have, you need to be aware of when you create your mesh. So right now, in this original model, when I have the mesh and the surface, they're actually, the mesh and nerves, they're actually overlapping. So right now it looks the same, but when you click on them, you can select, select mesh or per fully surface. So when you're exporting it, you don't want to just export everything. You want to actually just select the meshes and export these because, um, you know, otherwise you'll, you'll have everything double and it's going to make your file unnecessarily heavy. So as you see, this is a little, little Mozilla Hub setup where I built an environment around it. You could also leave that away and just have it open and like infinite space, but it's nice you know, to be a little bit contained. So here you have, you know, uh, I can build just a simple dome and put a, put a texture on it. Um, and here I'll 
use a water kind of texture in Mozilla Hub. So this will this is just open up, up uh, kind of leaving it open and anticipating that I'm going to be using kind of like a um, iterative water texture that appears here. So um, another important thing you have to think about in Rhino before you export it, um, your model should be in scale one to one in meters. And that's not because I'm European, it's just a Mozilla thing. I don't know why they chose to, meter is the default scale. So if you have your model in inches or whatever other units, just go to type units and then um, you can change it to meters in there. So, you know, it's already the meters here, but accept whatever scale, you know, it says, should I scale it times so and so, just accept that and then it will be in the right scale and you come into hubs. And scale is important in hubs because you will be experiencing it in sort of a first person perspective. And so, you know, when your model is too small or too big, um, it's not going to be uh, working for you. Um, and that's really it. So that's, you know, those are the main things you need to understand before you're uh, exporting it. And the file format to export it, and actually I'm going to go back to that slide really quick that I skipped over earlier, um, because that one hopefully explains it um, kind of precisely. So here, the you know, you're in Rhino, you turn it into a mesh, and then you export it as an OBJ into Blender. And Blender is a open source so modeling software um, that, um, you know, is awesome and that allows you to export the OBJ into a GLTF. And the GLTF is a kind of web mesh format that can be readable by Spoke, and Spoke is sort of the editor, the kind of free web editor from which you publish into hubs. So it's really just, you know, this sort of, it's these two steps because this one is just, you just click and it goes. You don't have to do anything, any translation here, but it's, it's unfortunately, it's not just import, export, it's import, it's export, import, export, import. But anyway, this will soon hopefully be a little bit more streamlined. Um, I don't think that because, you know, the reason that this is like that is because Ryan is not a mesh modeler. Um, and I, I, I looked on the forums and it seems like at least in the near future, GLTF is not in, plan for Rhino, but we'll see. Maybe if there's a critical mass, if everyone starts using Mozilla Hub, maybe they'll build, they'll build it as a plugin. Um, so then, so you export it as an OBJ. I'm just gonna assume that you know how to export stuff in Rhino. If not, you just select all, you say export selected and then choose OBJ as a file format. Then you open up Blender and I'll just save this file and uh, make a new file so you get the whole experience. So one thing that happens, uh, okay. this is not, as you see, I'm not, oh here, um, as you see, I'm not a Blender expert actually, um, but uh, it's, you don't need to do much in Blender actually uh, in this case, you, it's really just kind of a, a travel uh, kind of travel tool. Spot. So in Blender you go to file, import, and then choose OBJ. And here in, um, I have here my tutorial and I have my um, island file that I, that I exported earlier. So it will look something like this. And this is just a default box. You can delete that blender kind of for some reason already puts into your file. So here you see your object and it loses the textures, but don't worry about it. it. The textures are just not previewed, but the textures are actually still there. For some reason, Blender doesn't want to display it. Don't worry about it. Um, if, you know, in Spoke, you'll actually know if the textures have arrived or not. So next step, very simple. Don't do anything, just hit export. And then here you have the GLB or GLTF exporter. So here, um, I'm gonna make a new folder for it. And then here, so you can say selected objects um, if you don't want to export the whole model. And then if you're working with animation, um, you can also choose your settings here, but by default, you just export the whole scene. And so next thing, um, in Mozilla Spoke, so Spoke is the, is the web editor. Oops. Um, so this is, this is where I already, this is the scene that we saw earlier, kind of like fully, fully ready. So 
want to show you how it looks when the scene is done. I want to just make a new scene um, just so that you get the work done. So here, this is the, the web access hubsmozilla.com slash spoke or dash spoke. So here you see my, my dashboard. I already have a few different scenes that, that, that I've tried out. Um, so you just hit new project. And then you get a few defaults, which are usually not overly attractive. That's kind of, they're kind of weird. I recommend, I usually like you starting with the wide open space because if you just click new empty project, it actually gives you a weird landscape. So, you know, wide open space is kind of like the most neutral one. So here, and here we, we have a few things already in the scene. So we have spawn points and we have a 3D editor that looks pretty familiar to what we, what we kind of know. Um, what is a spawn point? So remember when we teleport, when, when we pick the hub link, you arrived into a particular point, and this that's the spawn point. So basically, that's 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 the kind of uh, you know wherever wherever people are arriving is going to be the spawn point. So this scene already has four points for some reason, but I don't need all four. I just want to have one. Um, so here you see the hierarchy. So basically, everything that is in this scene is going to be listed on. Uh, in this tab, which is pretty nice because, you know, it's kind of like a simple overview in terms of everything that's in there. So now I can, down here, I have all kinds of different elements. So there is, and that's actually kind of to Katie's question earlier in terms of creating, you know, things in VR. So there's actually an architecture kit. So you could, you know, I mean, it's, I don't know, let's see, so you could technically build a design fully here. There's like stairs and all kinds of defaults, but generally you, you have your own assets. And here you see things that I've uploaded in the past are all here archived, which is really convenient, you know. Once I've uploaded something, it's going to be here forever. And I have 3D models, I have images, um, haven't uploaded any videos yet, but I could. And if I have custom audio for the scene, I can also upload it here. So my assets is basically everything I've uploaded is kind of collected. And elements uh, includes all the kind of default um, elements that you know Spoke is giving me to work with. But so to import my uh, file that I saved out earlier, I just have to find the folder um, tutorial. And so um, oh, sorry, I saved it in the other one. Um, let me do Should have seen the desktop. No, wait. Uh, oh, I, well, actually, it doesn't matter. It's also been exported here because I did that. I did the same thing before. So here, um, so you can see the. Um, yeah. So here are my GLB files. So here's the um, OBJ version, and then here's the GLB file. So I can just drag and drop it in, and that's really the crucial point. It's super easy. You don't need to do anything fancy, you just drag and drop stuff. Um, and you know, it's it's like, so if you're under 20 megabytes, that's like a really good size. If you, um, you can probably get a lot, go a little bit heavier. You saw that the scene that we went in earlier was loaded pretty quickly. So it overall had maybe like 30 megabytes of data um, because I also have, have these animations, basically animated this these objects floating up and down. Um, of course, now because it's a demo, it's loading really slowly. So, but that's why I kind of preloaded the scene. Um, it, it kind of works a little faster before. But the Im important crucial point is for geometry, just drag it and drop it onto the scene, and then it will appear uh, in the scene uh, with textures, and even, even if it didn't preview properly. So, um, you know, in wide open space, you can set things like the fog. Um, so here you see the, the fog effect is something that is really helpful because you know the there's not too much without fog. This whole scene looks a lot less romantic. So that is right here in the in the wide open space. Um, so in assets, I guess it's one of these things where you just should play around a little bit. You know, I also just there's not too many tutorials out there yet, um, uh, but there's some some videos you can you can access. There's um, the particle emitters, that's how I generated these bubbles coming up. And the way it works is 
you know, if you've been using any kind of free software, like free Max is quite similar. You have here the stack, the hierarchy stack of all the different um, elements, and then you can upload an image, any kind of PNG, um, and then create uh, articles within there. And you can play around with scale, randomness, and how many emitters are coming out. Um, and similarly down here, you have simple water, which is essentially just a plane you put in and it automatically generates water. So it's still a kind of a little bit limited uh, range of, uh, of objects. So I've also created little animations, just simple sort of like up and down movement for these, for these volumes. If you want to get into animation, that's like a slightly longer tutorial. Um, you know, hit me up, I'm happy to explain it to you, but essentially you need to animate the objects in Blender and then bake the animation in and bring them, bring it into hops and then that's going to be part of your scene. So, um, yeah, but essentially, you know, if you really just want to do, uh, get the geometry going, this, are, this is the step you bring in a GLP. One thing that I really love is bringing music. So, um, here you have audio, so you can just um, click the audio button and drop it into the scene. And then, uh, so I already have an audio in there, so this is my second audio. But the nice thing is, it's so simple. You just copy paste a URL, and so I'm going to delete this one because I already have one, but I can show you the one that I already had. So I just use a SoundCloud, any SoundCloud, link, public SoundCloud link will work. So it's just like, you know, a kind of mix that I like that I thought would fit this sort of calm atmosphere. And that's it. And then, but the audio, what's important to know about the audio is that it's spatialized. So basically, if you get closer to the audio, you, you can notice if you walk around that, the hub scene, then you get closer to that point where it is right now. But that's why I put it kind of central because I want it to just be heard everywhere. Um, it's going to be louder. And down here, you can actually, you can control the volume, and you can make it louder. And you can even uh, control the distance uh, model and how far off into the distance. So here, the maximum distance is like, you know, 10,000, it goes really far, 10,000 meters. But um, you could also decide if you have complex models in multiple rooms, you could have the audio only in a very small radius and within a small room. Um, yeah, and then you have, you know, lights, you can play around with different lights. Again, the lighting is not super advanced yet. There's like, you know, not too many shading options and there's no ambient occlusion, stuff like that. So if you want to have more advanced lighting things like ambient occlusion, you would have to bake that into the textures and bring the textures in. Um, but yeah. Um, so when you're done, you know, uh, kind of want to see a first version, you just hit publish to hubs. And then it will basically transfer the scene into hubs. And now it's like a little bit, I think it's thinking too much. <laughs> my computer, my laptop, okay. That book might be overloaded from all the things that are happening. Um, but this is exactly the scene that I saw earlier. So, you know, once you hit publish to hubs, it just set, goes to, okay, because this is still uploading. I wonder if it goes this one. Um, so, exactly. So, with publish to hubs, um, actually, I, I turned off the blog. Let's not do that. Bring the hub back. <laughs> um, so, it, it generates a little screenshot. You can give it a name and then export the scene out. And, you know, again, you want to always be careful of making big files because it'll just amplify um, the problems. So here you see, I, it gives you kind of feedback of how well you did in terms of, um, <laughs> in terms of following guidelines. So my polygon, polygon count is pretty good. I do have like 57 unique materials because I really want these hand written textures on everything. But that's fine. That's important for my project. And file size, it's like, you know, it's giving me like a little bit of complaint, but it's okay. Medium is fine. <laughs> so with architects, you'll never have, you'll never be like 100% efficient. <laughs> but it's it's kind of nice that it gives you, you know, gives you grades <laughs> of how well you did. So now you can go and view your scene, and you will like create a room with your scene, um, and that's it. Then you know it loads it in hubs. And then you can enter your scene and share it with other people. Any questions from you guys about this? So you see, this is the spawn point. This is where the little, um, and I can move the guy around, right? So uh, 
here in my list somewhere. Not right here. Okay, so here's the spawn point. And you see here, if I move this character and I can also or decide the orientation which way they're looking. So I can also have them, you know, kind of further away or some, whatever, whatever works for the scene. Um, and this is, so if I republish it, this is going to be the spot where um, I would come out. Um, yeah, questions. Oh, I, I landed in the water somehow. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess uh, maybe, maybe we'll leave it at that. And then uh, I am planning to make videos for this, for the skills trail, so that, you know, you have kind of a permanent, permanent access to these videos. And I'll also take this, this lecture and, and demo on YouTube, uh, or can I upload it to YouTube so you can, you can find it. Oh, the animation. <laughs> okay. So, I can show it real quick if you guys are still, if you want to hold on. Um, I was just worried it would be, it would get too long, but it's a small but captive audience here. <laughs> so uh, I did it in Blender. So here I can show you. Uh, so back to Blender, go into the OBJ. And here I just have these little, um, you know, just copy and add whatever one, two, three. So this is one of the shapes that I animated. Um, and so basically Blender, you know, I've never used it before, but I just looked up simple animation tools and the way it works, you press, you have a timeline down here, you press I and with I you create, you create a keyframe for location. And then you can go to like, you know, 100, or whatever, whatever time frame you want to have, you move it and then you press I again and press location again. Then you move it to, but you, you know, because you want to have a continuous movement, you want to move it back to its original position because then it will just loop. You move it back, you press I again and you press location. So, but that's not enough, just animating. So now it's animated in, um, in Blender uh, or not. I guess the demo effect just hit, hit me. It, it was going pretty well so far, but <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, now, okay. I think the first keyframe didn't. Okay, it's just moving very slowly. But you see, you see that this thing is is slowly moving down. So uh, it's animated, but you want to also bake the animation, and you do that by going here. There's something called nonlinear animation, and when you when you click that, there, this this sort of drop down menu here appears. I don't know what it does. It's called push. You push it. You you press that button that I just did, and then it's baked in into the object. So then you do the exact same thing you just did before. You say export, uh, and then um, the GLTF file again. And here I'll just call it Hubs2, export GLTF. And then, oh, actually, never mind. Okay, I didn't. So now I don't export a full scene, I just want to export that one thing I have selected, right? So here you want to make sure include just selected object, and animation is already checked, so that needs to be checked just to make sure. And then when you go back to Hubs, so you import it the exact same way that you know, you import the other geometry, just drag and drop it. But the one thing you have to make sure, because I actually ran into that problem and it was really annoying until I figured it out. Uh, the one thing you want to make sure is that before you publish, so this is one of the, one of these objects that I animated. So here, uh, when you select the object, it gives you the position and it gives you the URL, whatever is uploaded. But by default, loop animation is, not selected it just says none and when you publish it it'll just won't it won't do anything and so you want to have that selected so all of my models here you see this one and this one they all have that 
loop animation selectors. So you have to do that for each piece. And then, uh, yeah, when you publish it, then it's gonna should hopefully play. You don't see it, and there's no preview in um, in Spoke, unfortunately, for the animation. So you kind of have to trust that it's there, and remember that you have to hit that button. So that's it. That's a trick. Um, it's really again uh, not a Blender animator. I've done a lot of 3D Max stuff, and I'm actually. One thing I'm working on right now is figuring out how to, there is a plugin for 3D Max to export um, uh, Chiltia files, but somehow I haven't been able to get it to work there because that would be easy for me because I know better how to animate in 3D Max, but it seems like the default software that a lot of people are using is Blender. Um, so I'm also not sure about the baking baking animation part in Max and stuff like that. So at the moment, at least this is one workflow that works. So. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend, you know, I'm sure there's going to be more different paths and different ways to, to do it, but this is one then. Cool. All right. <laughs> Any more questions or thoughts? Enough for today. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for listening and, um, you know, being here and being engaged and, um, yeah, come to the next one in two weeks. We're gonna get deeper into these things and uh, talk about representation in a, in a larger sense and also have a really awesome guest, Leah. Um, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll stop it here, and, but be in touch. And if you have any app questions, just you, you all have my contacts, so just, just hit me up. <laughs> all right, have a good night. <laughs>